Okay. So I'd like to welcome our guest today. We have with us, um, best known as Victor on Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul, Jeremiah Bitsui. How are you today, Jeremiah? I'm doing well. Thank you. Thank you guys for having me. Oh, thanks for coming yeah. on. We're super psyched to have you today. Yeah, so, this is um, awesome. <laughs> so, you know, we're, we're in a strange time right now. And, uh, you know, a lot of people um, have been impacted by the the pandemic. So first question I want to ask is how has your life changed with uh, this pandemic? Uh, good question. So um, yeah, just a little bit of the background. I've, I've, uh, I've uh, actually been in film and television since I was five and that was kind of by my own design uh, in terms of being motivated to I don't know, just do something. And I was uh, had severe allergies. I come from a um, a family that uh, it loves rodeo and loves horses and being outdoors and livestock and all of that. And uh, uh, funny enough, uh, God's joke on on my family. It turned out to be like allergic to every single thing uh, related to rodeo. So horses, hay. Um, pollen from pretty much anything that that cows and horses eat uh and so anyways the reason why i give that is because um me kind of being the bubble boy and and being a runt in relation to rodeo and and livestock and horsemanship um it it gave me a i had nothing else to do but stay in and, and watch film and television as a kid and when other parents would say, hey, go out and play, you know, go ride your bike, uh, get away from the TV. My parents were like, stay inside, you know, we don't want to go to the ER <laughs> kind of thing. Yeah. And, um, and so at a very young age, I was, I was interested in, in TV and, and film. And I, I kind of related to the outside world in that sense, uh, just because I, was, I felt very isolated as, as a young person. So... Um, oddly enough, like this period in time is very, <laughs> I, I can, I can kind of go back to that place uh, of isolation and quarantine quite easily. Um, but it, it's through that period that I, that some creativity was really bred within me to, um, I guess just look at the world and, uh, the first role that I could actually identify with as a, uh, me being a kid trying to identify with something was as a as a ninja um i watched a lot of martial arts films and that was to me how kids are probably looking at iron man i would look at ninjas and ninjas were like i i wanted to be a ninja and um and so a japanese film crew came to my town i was five years old and um i ended up booking my first role uh not as a ninja but as a kid just uh, the, the project was about kind of like everyday life from a kid that lived on a res, uh, which I, I came from the Navajo reservation. And, um, and so I guess I've been at it for a while. Uh, and times like this are times that I really kind of get to kind of hone in and create my own ideas and stories. And uh, we had a web series that we launched right before the pandemic. And we were able to get out uh, a couple episodes and we called it Breaking Dad. Um, I'm a father of two years and new to being a father and a husband. So I just really um, wanted to share the experience. And we had this whole idea of how we were going to capture what my life was at the time, which was a lot of travel and bringing the family along and balancing professional life as an entrepreneur and as an actor and that all came to a halt so we're revising uh kind of a D diy type um uh making it more applicable to that um i play a lot of characters as you probably know that uh, shoot handguns and automatic weapons and all kinds of fun things and so i, I keep up with that training um the the gun club that i belong to is private so i've been able to kind of uh stay keeping victor uh, well trained in this period of time and um i have some great advisors people that kind of pour into me I, on the broad end of the spectrum i play 
Victor, who's of course a henchman on one side, and then I play um, uh, I'm on a show uh, on Amazon called uh, Bosch, and I'm playing Billy Hardrow, an LAPD officer. And so it, the two of them just kind of having that spectrum and being able to stay on top. I think that's as an actor, that's kind of how I, I hone into my skill uh, in grounding myself into some type of, uh, some type of skill or some type of uh, craft. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's helpful. And then there's no auditions, which usually helps me um, keep myself sharp as an actor. So I've been kind of just doing my own audition uh, technique and, um, and I, believe it or not, that's probably 10% of my professional life. And the rest of it is, uh, I'm an entrepreneur. I have a construction company and then I have, I work also in, um, alternative investments. So, um, both of those things, luckily I can do, uh, with everything shut down, but a lot of this, a lot of zoom, a lot of uh, conference calls and, uh, I have my home <laughs> workstation here set up, which I can show. Uh, and then just upgrading things, upgrading uh, hardware, software, filing a lot of stuff that I've always intended to file. Um, I, I think really kind of declouding, I would, I would say that declouding, decluttering and defragging everything in life right now. That's the best way I could describe it. So I know that's a long explanation, but it's a little bit of my background as well. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure your wife appreciates that. I know like there are things I should be doing and I started doing a podcast almost full time instead because that's much more interesting than cleaning up and decluttering. So. <laughs> oh man. Well, it's one of those rabbit holes like where you, you have something bigger that you should be focused on and then you start tooling around with your desk, and the things that are in your desk. And then next thing you know, you're taking your desk apart. And then next thing you know, you're reassembling drawers and then you're coming up with a better filing system and all of that. So you can prevent yourself from doing the things that you really should be doing. Exactly. <laughs> you know, and speaking of things. auditions, I, I don't know. Do you follow um, David Yuri on Twitter? Um, he, was, uh, he was actually, he was on one or two episodes of Breaking Bad, um, but we talked to him a few weeks ago and he's been doing these crazy uh, dramatic monologue readings of, sh of TV show themes. Oh, cool. That's what he does. That's awesome. Craft going and it's, it's, oh, it's worth checking out if you get a chance. That's great. Yeah, I'll have to. And um, you mentioned you have, so you have a construction company too that, that you're still working in right now. Yes, sir. Um, I had yeah. seen a, a news article. It's, it's modular buildings. Did I, did I, am I getting that right? Uh, yeah. So we've, <clears throat> so um, the, the background of it, it's really kind of, uh smart construction base so meaning we bring a lot of innovative construction technology um with covid as you could imagine uh the deployable solutions are uh modular in nature so you know the the need isn't hey can you design build us which we could um you know this uh huge uh hospital complex uh, absolutely but you can't build it unfortunately here with the current laws and everything else uh in six months so mm -hmm. or, or in 60 days or even the question is in two weeks you know when things were really busy hey could you help us we need x y and z and we need beds and we need x and all this and we need it in two weeks so the deployable solutions of structures and infrastructure um we have the capacity to do uh not only housing but offices uh, data center and um, telecom uh, wireless broadband um, all all modular and that's really where the need is now um, I come from the Navajo Nation and and we have a huge lack of infrastructure um, as you may have seen um, there's uh, there's a a big uh, gap of, of infrastructure in terms of water, electric power, and data. And, uh, and because of it, it makes it really hard for folks to quarantine back home. And, and also, you know, wash your hands and just everything that you do in a city center, um, you have that challenge back home. So 
we look at providing solutions to rural communities and oddly enough, even cities and states that are, um, you know, large metropolises are, are needing uh, these types of solutions. So that's the space that we're in. Yeah, I, I seem to remember reading something um, just recently that the like the Navajo Nation has been hit disproportionately hard by the um, COVID-19. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's, yeah, there's, and, you know, everyone has their own theories. I'm, I'm sure there's a study that'll come out and, you know, they're, they're probably working on it, uh, developing the, the data now. But just from my thinking is that you have, uh, you have a gap of, of folks that live so spread out in rural, you know, and, um, and uh, it, it's not like New York where you're in a densely populated area. And so the challenge of it is that people have to go and they have to convene in these areas that have uh, supplies, food, and, and water, and and they're, you know, uh, all rushing to try to, and then plus on top of that, you have uh, a lack of um, toilet paper and cleaning supplies, and there's things that aren't making it to the stores. So then they're having to travel even further out to try to get those those items, and um, for the older community, uh, it's a challenge for them because they don't speak English. English is, you know, maybe that Navajo is their first language. And so when you have people getting on the, the radio or calling them, talking about, uh, about um, the curve, you know, beating the curve, it, it doesn't translate. And they're like, what, what are you talking about? Or there, there's uh, no way to translate some of, some of these the the current requirements that that are being imposed by CDC or by the state. So um, those are the challenges. You know, it's it's really tough. It's it's hard to see back home, but uh, I'm hoping that we're able to provide some good solutions as well. Excellent. Does it work better if I if I leave it like this, or what would work better? Whatever works for you. Whatever works for you. Um, yeah, yeah. Oh, it looks good that way. Okay. Um, so we talked a little bit before we got into this, um, about, um, maybe like some music you like, you mentioned a little bit about a Breaking Bad playlist or stuff. Yeah. Um, you want to talk a little bit about, you know, what kind of music you like to listen to or, um, or, you know, a little bit more about that. Yeah, let me see if I can actually, we created a whole playlist and I'll, I'll see if I can find it and share it with you. Um, but it was a whole playlist related to to the Breaking Bad soundtrack. And um, I'll just Google it because a lot of these, these songs are, are currently. Uh, uh, yeah, you can probably find it on iTunes and everything else. But yeah, I mean, when, you know, music was such a heavy part of the show uh, and there were so many iconic songs that made it into, made it onto the show. And I think to speak of Vince and his vision, the, it's amazing that now people um, are able to reassociate the that the music with with our show, which is which is quite amazing. You know, like uh, you have Baby Blue. I'm just going through uh, Marty Robbins' El Paso. You have a lot of these uh, epic songs that just you know, in some ways now when people look at it, they're looking, going down by the monkeys. I mean, they're looking at our show as the context or if, if they never, you know, for one generation that didn't li live in the time when some of these, these songs were, were out, uh, this is the context for them. So it's actually pretty cool. Um, uh, America's but yeah, so name, I, I think a wall every time I hear that song now. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, there's, there's so many, like, I, I, I think um, I, it, it's amazing how even still with, with Better Call Saul, um, you know, music is such a huge part of it. But yeah, I mean, I, I think you could do, you could do several episodes just on the music related to Breaking Bad. Yeah, you know, it's funny you mentioned that because I, I remember there was an episode where the cold open is this, um, is this. Mexican band singing about Heisenberg and yeah 
it seems kind of funny, but I read somewhere that there's like this whole thing with Mexican bands singing like country you, western songs about cartels. Yeah. And it's yeah, all it's about a, our music. Yeah, there's actually, there's a, a really great, and I had nothing to do with it, so I'm not pitching anything. Um, there's a really great documentary, and I believe, uh, again, I'm looking at my screen over here, but um, I think it's called uh, Narco Corrido, and there was a documentary, and they're basically ballads uh, that are created, and I, I think I think it was called Narcos Corridos. Uh, that was the name of the, the actual um, documentary. But um, yeah, I mean, in the documentary, if you watch it, though, people that are even street level dealers will commission uh, these bands to create songs about them. So it was cool that, that, that there was a nod to that, you know, that idea. And so Heisenberg having his own song, that was something that's really authentic to that whole world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Vin, still, you know, I, I, I tell some people outside of podcasting, I'm, I'm a scout leader. And um, one of the merit badges I teach is movie making, which is supposed to be about movies. Almost every single time I talk about like incredible filmmaking, I'm talking about Vince Gilligan. Like he's just looked yeah. hired yeah. people on TV, you know. Oh man, I mean, I'm telling you, like it's. Uh, I have a picture. I wish I'll send it to you guys. Maybe you could pop it up um, if if that fits the show. But um, there's a photo I have where, and it was my final scene on Breaking Bad, as you remember, box cutter, and um, and I think I have. Uh, Giancarlo on one side here and um, on the other side of I me, mean, we're both listening to Brian Cranston and Brian Cranston's giving his perspective and I'm telling you this is like an acting master's class like I'm sitting here like you, you want to be present as an actor and and be able to not just be overblown by like the whole thought of holy like this is Brian Cranston giving one of his most epic roles ever in probably you know in his lifetime and then you have of course Giancarlo who I've followed since I was a kid do the right thing and everything else and I'm sitting here trying not to be mind blown and just taking it like okay this is my work like right. you know uh this is this yeah this is where I'm supposed to be and I think as an actor that's always the part where you're having to manage and just realize these are co-workers uh, very respectable co-workers um so don't be too blown away when you you do your job and and the only reason why i say that is because um yeah it's definitely from vince gilligan to uh uh i mean pretty much any of our writers any of our directors uh but definitely brian through that series you know he directed on his own as well and the level of depth and things that he added and just how flexible he was you know once i became a little bit more um open to the thought like yeah you're you're an actor too and you can give feedback in in and maybe in, in ideas um and it was definitely that environment um we do these rehearsals and everyone would clear off and we could and they'd hide behind you know uh they tuck behind things and equipment and we just have a sacred space to deliver our rehearsals that that's amazing that's something you don't get in independent film and uh, and and i'm still to this day i'm blown away but uh brian with that being said i just had this feeling there was a scene where we're in um the super lab and i'm telling brian i'm like do you mind i was like do you this is more for me and if if it doesn't fit what you're doing, no problem. But do you mind, do you feel like you might grab me and grab my arm in this scene? And he's like, oh yeah, let's try it. We tried it and it worked. And I, I feel like I like created, like I, my idea was, you know, of course I was just floating thinking like that, that he really loved that idea, but you know, it came, gave me a different sense of confidence that mm -hmm. as an actor, I'm not just a spectator and, and a fan, I'm, I'm engaging and I have, I have credible ideas that, that, that fit the flow and that don't work against uh, the scene or other characters. And um, 
and so that it's an amazing gift to be a part of you know just this continued um space and 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 storytelling so um not to overblow everything else but i i'm just um yeah, I, I could go on and on about that part. It's oh, amazing. Mm. And it was such a great show. One of the things, and um, we, we talked to um, to Charlie Baker and, and RJ, both who were on the mm -hmm. show, too. Um, one of the things that I always thought was amazing about Breaking Bad is, obviously, you get top-notch directors and writers. But what you guys yep. brought to the role, like, Henchman, that's like a two-note character. Very one-dimensional. Yeah. Like, you yeah. build that role with so, so much life. Like, Victor is a memorable character. Like, I oh. remember when I saw that box cutter scene, like, I just wanted to get up and walk away. I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was, thank you, and I, I appreciate that. And that. I mean, that's really kudos to, I think, everyone on the show. They're really still who they are in terms of a person or personality, um, including, you know, Ch Charlie Baker and, and, um, and all the actors, you know, from from the top down whether if they were on they were on as uh, uh starring roles or are guest starring or um even if they just made a brief appearance and and had a career that brought blossomed from it i mean everyone just kind of brought a different um level of realness and and as as people they're all people that you actually would want to hang out with you know, like RJ and, and and people that are are real and genuine. Yeah, you can you can. And I think that that's that's it's also. Uh, you can feel you're gonna say you can feel that. Yeah, like I mean, you, you know, for you play a bad guy, but you as a viewer, you yeah. care about Victor. Like, I'm like, he seems like a cool guy to hang out with, even though he's trying to go around with the nine millimeter <laughs> shooting people, but. You know, he's, he still seems cool. <laughs> yeah, and, and you know, um, I, I think what I was going to say is, like, I think Vince is honestly, like, for the mastermind that he is, um, like, the Warren Buffett of investing, like, he's, like, our Warren Buffett of storytelling. Like, he really, I think he masterminded even the culture that we, that was able to be created because, people that were on the cast and crew i mean people would just get along and and um we'd shoot a late night scene and it's not like you we, we'd hate each other or be working with people like oh man i'm tired of this guy i can't wait to get away from him we go have a beer afterwards um and uh and and stay and remain remain friends um but you know one memorable moment i always think of because i had no idea you know speaking of victor i I was casted originally. I was I was auditioning for the role of um, the Los Pollos Hermanos manager, which uh, was given to a very talented actress um, from from New Mexico. Obviously, there were I think they already they saw all the Los Pollos Hermanos potential managers, and I was at the very end of that. So I kind of got like the you know like we already made our decision but go ahead and read your lines and of course i gave it all that i i had um just because you prepare and you want to you that that's as an actor it's it's like it's your blow valve so that's my blow off valve the audition process is getting getting that little creative juice out there even if no one's paying attention and appreciate it and you know casting director uh sherry rhodes at the time she looked back at, at um adam bernstein and adam was just like hey, thank you we appreciate it and that either means two things it's like you either really sucked and you were horrible um or you smell bad and you you don't have any uh sense of of uh of space and and or you just or or they already made their mind up and, and you're just kind of, you're just, you're blowing steam. Um, and so, you know, you just walk out friendly, nice, and, and you just kind of have to, that's a part of the game. But in this case, they walked in and they said, uh, hey, we need you to come back in uh, and read for this character. It doesn't have a name, uh, but we think you'd be great. 
and that was the the first episode was um um mandela and so i thought that was it for me i thought i was kind of going to just be a one day day player and in and out but yeah. um i'd never imagine just just to bring it into perspective i never thought i'd be still playing this role today 12 years later yeah what's awesome about bringing you back on better call Saul is now you get to live you're going to make it through this series yeah yeah i know i get to have a little bit more confidence walking around yeah, <laughs> yeah wait for, <laughs> for many um <laughs> yeah for a lot of the time they would like for breaking bad for season four they were like yelling out it was exciting for me because i came to the to set and i didn't know what what really the deal was and they had aaron paul tell me and aaron was like hey man welcome to the show congratulations like you're you know basically giving me the heads up of what was going on and i was just blown away so it went from that to the end of the season like the crew would some of the catering guys would be like dead man walk in and um, <laughs> I, you know, I knew something was inevitable, but we, we all didn't know it until the you know beginning of the fourth season. So, um, but yeah, that was it was pretty epic from that standpoint. Yeah, just crazy to think how we grew into a cultural phenomenon, and 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 that one it's amazing. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, so um, when things finally start to get back to normal, um, you know, reboot, I'll call it. Um, what do you have coming up next? You know, yeah. anything you want to share? Uh, yeah, no, I mean, I, so, you know, hopefully, uh, fingers crossed that we have um, – everyone's safe and of course you know god willing all of our writers and all of our producers and all of our actors uh come through this safe i mean that's the biggest that's the biggest thing um you know definitely uh plan and hope to come back and reoccur on bosch and uh better call saul i think you know they can't kill me again so um you know that, that's the plan um and then you know movies i, I think I, I had been reading for a few films that were interesting and so you know hopefully something stokes there but all in all you know i mean on the acting side um it, it's just it's been a blessing it's been amazing to to be able to work with guys like vince you know uh clint eastwood oliver stone um jim sheridan i mean i put him right up there with uh with with all of the rest of them i mean to me, uh, even um, I, 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 there's a, a lot of talent, very talented directors. We did a film with an, a director by the name of Chris Eyre, who did Smoke Signals. Um, and it was a short film, which was shot in four parts of the continent and went to Sundance. It was called A Thousand Roads. And um, Claudio Miranda, our DP, two years later won an Academy Award for the life of Pi. So, mm. I mean, just being able to like ride on these coattails, you know, uh, it, it's, it's pretty amazing. And I, I consider myself blessed. So if it was all to end uh, at the end of the, you know, I, I don't want to say anything negative, but if it was all to come to an end, let's say career wise, I, I, I'd be proud and I'd be happy that, you know, I've had the, the luck and the the um, the ability so far. And you you mentioned um, you got a, a horror movie. Did you say it was Toe coming out? Yeah, T O W. And um, we actually uh, uh, I don't know if I'm able to disclose this, but um, let's just say a very notable uh, 1980s horror villain actor. Uh, and I can't mention, I don't know if I can mention names yet, but uh, that's, that's our villain. And to give you a clue, um, and I could probably give you a clue. I think it's, um, if you remember the, uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so it has that type of feel, which is cool. Cause I, I really, I love those, those old movies as well. Oh, that'll be fun. That that'll genre. Be cool. 
Cool. But awesome. being in being in a film like that, it's funny because, and I'll just leave it at, at this, is it's funny because you know what's coming. And as an audience, of course, you know, it's and it's like the whole thing where you'll be yelling at me like, damn it, Jeremiah, run. What are you doing? You know? <laughs> and when you're in the scene, you're sitting there like, you know, I, I, I probably wouldn't really put myself in this situation, but the way that they engineered it, it, it's it, it's actually a physical di- or it's a it's direction that I would actually probably as a, as a person I could see myself and I won't uh, kind of yes I'm giving away a little bit of my demise but um, it, it's you know you, you I think they're being very thoughtful of how it's not the thing where it's like oh my god that person was such a dumbass they deserve they deserve to 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 you know that whatever that guy did to him. Um, in this case, it's, it's like, I think they're really having characters move smartly and it's a, it's a real cat and mouse game. So oh. Toe is, uh, mm. is actually pretty kind of cool from that standpoint. And it, in a nutshell, the, um, the plot is a woman, uh, is in abandoned area desert and ends up, um, having some car troubles and the toad truck shows up and the this is probably the tow truck driver from hell that you'd never want to meet and um as you could imagine the story kind of propels from there and um she she is the uh the the, um she's she ends up being the the hero of the film which is kind of cool so Hmm. yeah I look forward to that. Yeah. Now, you know, I, I have to ask, and, um, yeah. you know, as, as much as I would love to talk to Vince someday, I don't want him coming after me to kill me. Um, yeah. Any Anything uh, you can spill about upcoming Better Call Saul or uh, is that? Oh, my gosh. Yeah, I mean, I, I think – I, I don't know if there's even anything that that I know, and I think they keep it very quiet because, at least for us actors – you know, because they don't want to go on this plane where it's like, yeah, we're playing with the idea that you might do X, Y, and Z. And then, you know, and then they come back and they're like, yeah, well, we just decided that you would do, you know, uh, that Victor wasn't going to do all that action. And he was just going to end up sitting in a car and watching everybody for the, the whole season. So it's like, I, I don't think they want to really uh, get our hopes up or, or get us depressed about our characters ahead of time you know i think they really want us to be able to kind of they they want that energy that we're reading it off of the page and and becoming excited about uh the process which really was like for breaking bad i mean i didn't know until a a few weeks before season was going to start and i was actually right before christmas and i got a call and they said hey jeremiah we really loved you being a part of the show it's amazing we're looking forward to this next season and we wanted to just call and thank you and let you know that you know we're excited for this next season and we're glad that you're going to be participating and uh we're going to start us off with a season with big bang and unfortunately you're the big bang so um you know i I think you know for some of the actors that may not make it uh whether they will or won't this season they'll they'll probably be hearing it the same way you know Mm. And I think they do that because they don't want to tie themselves in either. If they have a really great idea, I think they want to give the writers a great creative space for last minute ideas and, and plot points. Give them a chance to pivot a bit. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Nice. Which is cool. All right. And, and you also said you have a YouTube series, Breaking Dad. So I want to make sure we, yeah. we get that word out for you. Check. Yeah, that. Breaking Dad. It'll be very, um, if you watch it, it goes from being very uh, polished and nice to these upcoming episodes, which I'm going to create, are going to kind of be more of a a DIY, uh, as you could imagine, um, kind of a home quarantine uh, series. So it goes from very exciting and polished to now me shooting it and it being more uh homogenous from that sense more organic real life as they say <laughs> yeah real life <laughs> the real stuff which i don't know maybe people are more interested in, in general but we'll see 
but it's it's more for I guess it's uh, an engagement for for fans and and um, and just something that I thought would be kind of a cool project. Uh, I think I I realized you know, early along that like I I want to remember this period in, of time in life and kind of document it a little bit. You know, um, it's special to be coming to an end with this series and at the same time uh, a new beginning with my family and my daughter and my wife and um, I want to create those memories and share those memories so that's really what was a part of creating that i, I I'll, I'll warn you now i have a I, my daughter is 13 14 now um yeah. you know people will tell you all kinds of scary things about having a girl it's absolutely the most wonderful experience in the oh. world but i can guarantee yeah. you, you will be completely gray within the next five years <laughs> <laughs> so you get that to look forward to oh my gosh yeah i mean i'm it's it's fun it's amazing the things that she comes up with and uh yeah the next time you interview me i'll probably have uh, probably have some great hair yeah <laughs> well jeremiah thank you very much um for coming on today we love chatting with you uh, this is completely awesome mm. thank you guys and um and um take care man. yeah keep keep watching our shows and uh um yeah i mean thank you for for having me on and uh it was it was good to chat and be guys be safe um and take care wherever you are well you too you too